Good evening, everyone, and a special welcome to 16 ambassadors. What an honor to have you here. And thank you, President Kim. I, I think you must work for the Wilson Center. You know so much about our programming. Um, and I must thank you and the Korea Foundation for your enormous support of the work we do on Korea. Also, let me acknowledge uh, the, president, the presence of President uh, Park J JQ for his, and thank him for his invitation to this country. I'm delighted to be back. And I must also acknowledge Christian Osterman, I don't know, he left his chair again, there he's coming back, who it directs all of the Wilson Center work on Korea. Uh, as you heard, this is not my first visit to Korea. Uh, as a member of Congress, I was part of a delegation in 1997 that visited not only Seoul, but the DMZ and Pyongyang as well. There's an image from the DMZ that I've always carried with me of a stony-faced North Korean border guard looking not south, but north, as if he were more concerned, and I think he was, with defectors than any possible invasion. The name Woodrow Wilson is certainly not new to the Korean people. President Wilson's famous 14-point speech delivered in Paris at the Paris Peace Conference in January, thank you, 1919, and in particular, his call for national self-determination inspired one of the earliest public displays of Korean resistance to Japan's colonial rule the March 1st Independence Movement, an event which is still commemorated. Unfortunately, Wilson's inspirational call for self-determination did little to bring an end to Japanese rule and the suffering of the Korean people. It took another few generations for Korea, that is its southern half, to emerge as a vibrant democracy and economic powerhouse. I represent the institution that bears Woodrow Wilson's name, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. As many of you know, the center was established by an act of the US Congress in 1968 as the official memorial to Woodrow Wilson. And unlike the Washington Monument or the Lincoln Memorial, the Wilson Center is a living memorial whose work and scholarship commemorates the ideals and concerns of our 28th president. I also call it a safe political space where members of our Congress can tackle the tough issues that they cannot tackle where they work during the day, sadly. Uh, as both a distinguished scholar, Wilson was the only U.S. president to earn a Ph.D., and as a national leader, President Wilson felt strongly that the scholar and policymaker were engaged in a common enterprise. And so the Wilson Center hosts close to 800 events and over 150 scholars from around the world annually. Over the years, we've hosted many distinguished Korean academics and policymakers as visiting scholars, including Prime Minister uh, Lee uh, Hung-gu and former Seoul Mayor uh, Cho Sun, Jo Soon. As few, a few years ago, the Wilson Center was honored to host a dinner for the late President uh, New Moon Hoon, New Moon, No Moon Hoon, No Moon Hoon, pardon me, who was then visiting Washington. I need not tell you that every think tank and research institute was vying for that privilege, so it was most gratifying to be singled out for such distinction, which served to further solidify the cordial ties between the Wilson Center and the people of Korea. The Wilson Center is also reaching out, as you heard, to the next generation of Korean scholars and leaders. In 2011, in cooperation with the Korea Foundation, we launched the Korea Foundation Junior Scholar Program. The program provides Korean students currently enrolled in an advanced degree program at a non-U.S. university an opportunity to spend time at the Wilson Center. And I think one of those students is in this room, and she told me she misses us, and she wants to come back. So don't be upset if she leaves Seoul and moves back to Washington, because it's wonderful uh, at the Wilson Center. There is deep interest in Korea at the center, and two programs 
uh, that we have work on Korea. Our Asia program that largely focuses on current public policy issues and the history and public policy programs North Korea International Documentation Project. Uh, we usually call that HAP for history and public policy. Our Asia program regularly brings together key Korean analysts from the United States and Korea representing government, academia, and the NGO and private sectors to examine the stories behind the headlines on the Korean Peninsula. For instance, the program is working with a foundation here in Seoul to bring leading Korean parliamentarians, scholars, and other opinion molders to Washington in May to discuss the next generation of challenges facing our two countries. The luncheon speaker for this event will be Assistant Secretary of State and a good friend of mine, Kurt Campbell, the senior most official in the U.S. government with day-to-day -day responsibility for managing our relations with South and North Korea. We're pleased that your very able ambassador in Washington, His, Excellen His Excellency uh, Chai Young Jin, will host a post-conference dinner for all the participants. Our history and public policy program uh, collects, translates, and disseminates documents from the archives of North Korea's former, former communist allies, a hugely rich source on the otherwise still secretive and reclusive regime in the North. There is much we can learn about the history of inter-Korean relations from these materials. These documents help us identify missed opportunities, better appreciate important milestones, more fully understand historical patterns and behavioral and mental modes, and gain a broader understanding of important public policy implications. This will help policymakers today craft viable policies for future initiatives in inter-Korean relations. Based on our involvement in these activities, the Wilson Center has become, as you heard, thank you very much, President Kim, uh, one of the foremost institutions in the U.S. engaged in the study of contemporary Korea. We thank the Korea Foundation for its steadfast support of our Korea programming. In 2006, the center established a partnership with Kyung Nam University and the University of North Korean Studies, and for the past two years, we have hosted an annual Korea Forum, one of the signature events on Korea in Washington. And this past November, President Obama's point person on the NSC on nuclear nonproliferation issues, uh, Gary Seymour, uh, gave keynote remarks previewing some of the initiatives that the president and other world leaders discussed just last month at the Nuclear Security Summit here in Seoul. I met earlier today with the prime minister, and on the ground floor of his magnificent building is the picture of 53 leaders of countries, all here to discuss one of the most important uh, international security topics, and obviously one which directly affects this country, which, as we all know, is 65 kilometers from a nuclear state, which uh, does not, in every instance, uh, behave uh, responsibly. I applaud President Lee and all of you for hosting uh, such a significant event. The summit was central to global efforts to prevent the spread of nuclear materials and lessen the risk of nuclear terrorism. South Korea has shown real leadership in this area. And our alliance between South Korea and the United States has never been more critical. Through a multi-year oral history projects, my colleagues at the Wilson Center and their partners at Kyung Nam University are assessing that alliance over the past 60 years a partnership forged in the wake of a war, division, common sacrifice, and threats, but also the occasional disagreement among friends. We need to preserve these stories, and I appreciate the Foundation's support to bring together veteran policymakers from both countries to capture the history for future generations. By the way, copies of some of the materials we and our Korean partners have produced are available at the reception desk uh, just outside this room. So please pick them up. Recent visits by President Lee to Washington and by President Obama to Seoul have underscored the strength of the bonds linking our two countries. Since entering the White House three years ago, President Obama has visited Seoul more 
than he has visited any ca other capital in the world. Think of that, more than any other capital in the world. It is also widely reported that he and President Lee enjoy a special personal chemistry that goes far beyond customary diplomatic niceties. When President Lee came to Washington last fall, President Obama hosted a state dinner for him, one of the very few honors of this sort the Obama White House has given to any state leader. And during his most recent trip to Seoul last month, President Obama reaffirmed the commitment of the United States to the defense and security of the Republic of Korea. I share this commitment and did so and voted that way during my nine terms in Congress. Given the nature of my congressional district, my former congressional district in Los Angeles, I'm delighted to be back here. As you know, over 300,000 Korean Americans live in the greater Los Angeles area, and a large number of them reside in my former district, particularly in and around Torrance, California. The town of San Pedro, very nearby, in the southernmost part of my former district, is home to the Korean Bell of Friendship, a massive and intricately decorated bell donated in 1976 to the people of Los Angeles by the people of Korea to celebrate the U.S. Bicentennial, honor veterans of the Korean War, and to consolidate our friendship. The bell is patterned after the bronze bell of King Sung Duk, which was cast in 771 and is still on view in Korea today. Sometimes I think I was cast in 771. Uh, back in 2009, uh, working with, local Korean, with the local Korean-American community and religious leaders, I organized a moving vigil at the Friendship Bell in honor of Yuna Lee and Laura Ling, whom I'm sure you all remember, the two American journalists who were held in harsh conditions by North Korea for more than four months and released, finally, after a visit by former President Bill Clinton. Uh, as I mentioned, I was in Pyongyang 15 years ago, and uh, I have a funny story to tell about that. Congressional delegations often travel by military aircraft. And uh, for that trip, there were no standard aircraft available. So a refueling plane with no windows was retrofitted by adding a few rows of seats so that our delegation from the House Intelligence Committee and our staff could be accommodated. When we arrived at the airport in Pyongyang, the standard stairs that they move up to the door of an aircraft didn't fit. It was, the door was taller. And I could see the perplexed faces of uh, people on the airfield as we looked out at dusk. And I heard later that they thought we were in a spy plane and had I only heeded my late husband's advice, I probably never would have made the trip because it was quite terrifying. But the most terrifying part, uh, parts were the next day. Uh, first, I decided that I wanted to go jogging. And so I asked another member of Congress to go with me, and he wore his Air Force T-shirt. So. We we're jogging around downtown Pyongyang. We had no minders with us. I'm not exactly sure why they let us do this. But um, as we went by street corner after street corner, there were huge lines of people standing at bus stops in straight lines. And I wondered, this was during the height of the famine when I knew not only was there no food, but there was no work. I couldn't imagine where these people were going. And so as we passed these lines, we looked behind them, and there were soldiers with assault weapons walking behind the lines. It was, it was quite something. Then we had a meeting with uh, members of the foreign ministry, and I asked uh, a senior member what it would take to get Korea, North Korea, to stop proliferating missile technology, something I've been concerned about for many years. Without missing a beat, he said, how much will you pay us? Today, no one questions the link between North Korean missile technology and Iran's dangerous capabilities. So the Wilson Center watches events in North and South Korea carefully, and the elections for the National Assembly offer a stark contrast with the recent political trans transition 
in the DPRK. As a former member of Congress who served on all the major security committees, I'm disappointed but not surprised by North Korea's abrogation following its failed missile launch of the Leap Day Agreement to allow back IAEA inspectors. And I think I would not be surprised, and I doubt you would be, if, if the DPRK goes ahead with a third missile test and possibly even another weapons test. Understanding the implications of Kim Jong-un's uh, ascent for the future of the North uh, Korean regime, the, the Korean Peninsula and the, and the broader Asia-Pacific region is an art, not a science. But it appears that the transition has been smoother than many predicted. I was uh, in um, Tokyo yesterday uh, as a member of the Trilateral Commission which met there, and we had discussions about whether um, Young Un's rule would bring uh, change in North Korea in the short term, and most people thought not, uh, which obviously is disappointing. Uh, but um, it should be clear that the concerns about the North Korean government and its direction are not uh, concerns, or, or at least are, do not show any a a animosity toward the North Korean people. Um, uh, the North Korean people uh, are, are in the hearts of the American people, and I'm sure, no doubt, in the hearts of the uh, people of South Korea. But neither nation is prepared to welcome into the community of nations a North Korea that is a menace to its neighbors and a threat to regional security. North Korea's long-range missile and nuclear tests have implications in the volatile Middle East as well, and I know the Israeli ambassador is here. Twelve Iranian rocket experts actually traveled to Pyongyang to observe the launch of North Korea's missile, an indication of an unholy alliance between Pyongyang and Tehran. Indeed, they appear to be pulling pages out of the same playbook. On February 3rd, Iran successfully launched what it claimed was a peaceful satellite into orbit with its Sapphire missile launch vehicle. Both North Korea and Iran must understand that they cannot thwart international norms. This is an important message to send, particularly with a new round of talks scheduled to take place in Baghdad next month. Although North Korea is the most closed society in the world, developments beyond its borders, particularly in the Middle East, have captured the attention of the country's leadership this year. Every time an authoritarian regime falls around the world, it gives the Kim dynasty yet another reason to worry about opening up. Indeed, social media played a, a key role in mobilizing crowds in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and Bahrain over the past year. I was in Tunisia during the elections for the Constitutional Assembly. It was moving to see people participate in the first free and fair election in the, the country had witnessed in 40 years. I met with the head of the Ennahda party, that's the uh, Islamist party that won uh, a plurality of votes in Tunis, and again during his visit to Washington when he spoke to a group of us at the Wilson Center. My colleagues and I pressed him hard on women's rights in Tunisia, and he ensured us that his, co that his party will not tamper with Tunisia's personal status law, which is the most progressive uh, in the region. I also visited Egypt and talked to the young people from Tahrir Square and marveled at their dreams for a free, just, and prosperous Egypt. I spoke to members of the Freedom and Justice Party, that's the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, during, their visit, during my visit to Egypt and during their visit to Washington a month ago and expressed concerns for the rights of minorities and women and the aspirations of young people who were instrumental in overthrowing the Ancien Regime. They are saying the right things. Now the question is, will they do them? My colleagues at the center and I have attended meetings with representatives from Libya. They have had conversations with men and women in Yemen, Kuwait, Bahrain, and Morocco, and we will continue to follow developments in the region very closely. And although the shift toward democracy is promising, the challenges ahead in the region are momentous. Despite the recent deadline for a ceasefire in Syria, 
the violence that has already left more than 9,000 innocent people dead continues. The international community needs to help stop the killing, which has gone on for far too long. I think that the best of imperfect options may be to offer Bashar al-Assad an immunity deal, something like what happened with uh, Saleh in Yemen in exchange for asylum for him and his family. I've suggested that Russia, which has offered political and military support to the Assad regime, take the lead on brokering this deal. Coupled with increasingly coercive sanctions, a Moscow-led immunity deal would not only save many lives, but would also be a significant blow to Iran, Assad's main ally in the region. And that kind of blow might just help, along with the more and more coercive sanctions that the world uh, is, is uh, imposing on Iran, change that regime's policy uh, about nuclear weapons. Geopolitical power shifts is one of the, made, uh, of the many global challenges, ranging from nuclear proliferation and nuclear terrorism to environmental degradation and financial crises that the international community faces today. On all these issues, the U.S. and South Korea know that we can count on each other today and in the future. The close ties between our two countries have recently been reaffirmed with the Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement. Uh, this was and remains a contentious accord, one that sparked fierce opposition in both countries. However, it was the right thing to do, and it I am pleased to note that the pact received the approval of your National Assembly and our Congress and went into force last month. Whether it lives up to its promises remains to be seen, but what we do know, even at this point, is that it offers one more avenue that may serve to draw our two nations into closer partnership to the advantage of both. Long gone are the days when Korea could be considered merely a regional actor, not even a middle regional actor, Professor, uh, President Kim. I think Korea, Korea is a major player. And I think, based on recent events, you should be humble but proud that you have achieved that, that status. You have taken your rightful place on the global stage. There is, quite literally, no challenge confronting the 21st century that will not find Korea part of the solution. Just this past Saturday, South Korea announced that it would provide $15 billion to the IMF, helping to bolster the fund's lending capacity. This is an important contribution to the IMF's efforts to shore up the international financial system in the current economic crisis. And incidentally, Christine Lagarde, the first director of the IMF, who happens to be a woman, gave her first major policy speech uh, as managing director of the IMF at the Wilson Center um, just a few months ago. And this Thursday, she will be introducing uh, Hillary Clinton at our gala dinner, um, which honors Hillary Clinton um, later this week. If any of you will be in Washington, Please attend. So, from sending troops to Afghanistan to patrolling against pirates in the Arabian Sea, Korea increasingly looks beyond the security of the peninsula to consider the world's problems. A global Korea is good for the United States, good for the world, and I think very good for Korea. Let me conclude on a personal note. I know many Koreans. I know even more Korean Americans. I'm very comfortable in your country and with this community. But there are two Koreans uh, who live not far from here whom I have not met and hope to meet soon. You see, my 29-year-old son, Dan, graduated uh, last year from Columbia Business School and his classmate and serious girlfriend is a Korean-American. I wanted to meet her parents on this trip. <laughs> of course I did. Yeah, thank you. 
But Dan said no. And he said no because he hasn't met them. And he's coming here in July, and he said, Mom, I have to go first. So I'm sorry, I can't meet these parents. I won't tell you their names because then I'll get in more trouble with my son, and he's, I'm not ready for that. So he will be here in July with his girlfriend, meeting her parents, and we'll see what happens after that. But I'm guessing that I'll have very good reasons to come back again soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>